Okay, so mechanisms of overpressure. So last time we talked briefly about overpressure scenarios, right? And when we're talking about overpressure, this this really means it can mean one of two things. Uh, for the most part, what we're saying is greater than hydrostatic. Right? So any compartmentalized pressure with as you go down that is greater than hydrostatic pressure, which would be hydrostatic pressure is just column of water and what's the rule of thumb? 0.44 psi per foot. So any any increase with depth faster than that would be an overpressure scenario. There is one case where when we're talking about overpressure, we just mean overpressure with respect to uh, sort of what's around it, but uh, that'll be clear in just a second. Okay. Um, and and so we, we briefly talked about disequilibrium and compaction, and this is the idea that you know if we have a compartmentalized reservoir, and so we'll we'll say that there's some initial sediment and the reservoir is filled with fluid. And this fluid is, is going to continuously be diffusing into the layers around it via Darcy's law. And the idea of disequilibrium compaction is that we have sedimentation that's occurring faster than the fluid diffusion. So we're, we're building up layers on top, and this is continually diffusing. But the sedimentation occurs faster than diffusion, such that with increased sedimentation, we have increase in vertical stress, which is, you know, that increase in vertical stress and the fact that that's happening faster than the fluid is diffusing can cause the fluid to become trapped in an overpressurized scenario. It doesn't have time to equilibrate. In addition to that, if enough sedimentation is occurring fast enough, you can actually have, like, you know, you're, you're, you're just actually squeezing, right? So the, the excess weight on top, you know, is uh, squeezing the pores to the extent that eventually if there's enough, you could have some inelastic behavior where the pores actually collapse permanently. Right? And if that, so if you're squeezing the pores with this excess weight or collapsing the pores permanently due to this excess weight on top, uh, then you're going to increase the pressure. And if, if that increase in pressure can't, can't be diffused via Darcy's law, then you're going to have an overpressurized scenario. Uh, it could. It well, no, no. Um, it this increase in pore pressure could fracture the rock, okay. Um, but a pore collapse is a different mechanism. So this is not really. Um, You can have pore collapse without fracture. In other words, you know, you think of fracture as like a localized deformation that you know physically breaks the rock. Or in other words, if if I were to fracture, if I have a single piece of rock, and I were to say squeeze that rock and with without any external confinement, eventually I would break the rock and then I'd have at least two pieces. Right? That's a fractured rock. Right? However, if I add external confinement and I squeeze that rock on all sides, I can actually decrease the porosity permanently without fracturing. In other words, if I remove all the load and I take it out, I still have one rock. Right? It's, not, it's not visually two or three or four pieces, right? It's still one rock. But if you were then to measure the porosity of that rock, it, it could be permanently changed. Right? So it's, it's a different mechanism. Okay? Um, anyway. Uh, so at a, at a high level, every, everybody understand what this, this equilibrium compaction is? Right? It's, it's probably the most well understood uh, mechanism of overpressure. And it's certainly one that we're really familiar with because it's, this is the mechanism in the Gulf of Mexico. And why? Why? Mississippi River. 
So uh, we have this characteristic time of diffusion in a porous medium. So to try to understand where this equ equation comes from. So this is just a time t, right? So some characteristic time t uh, at some characteristic length. So this is like, this is how fluid, the characteristic time is for fluid to diffuse over some characteristic length L is equal to this equation. Right? And let's try to understand where that equation comes from. So just like I said, if, if you set out to solve a mechanics problem and you don't know where to start, a good place to start is F equals MA. Right? If you set out to solve a reservoir fluids problem and you don't know where to start, a good, word, a good place to start is Darcy's Law. Right? So Darcy's Law is you know, Darcy velocity V is equal to the permeability, this is one dimension, over the viscosity. Now, I know we usually use mu for the viscosity, but for some reason in Zoback's book, and I want to be consistent here with what's in Zoback's book in case you're reading along, uh, he uses eta. So permeability over the viscosity, uh, dp dx. Well, what's velocity in words? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, the dis it's, you know, distance traveled per time, if you want to say that, right? The length per time. So, uh, so yeah, we'll, we're just going to say, you know, we're, we'll replace this uh, this velocity with some characteristic length over time. So we're interested in this characteristic time that some fluid would take to diffuse over some arbitrary length L. Right. And so then if we just, oh, and then I guess we're also going to sort of use a discrete approximation of this derivative, right? Um, so we're going to, you know, discrete approximation of the derivative would be that there's some change in pressure over some change in X. And this, this change in x that we're interested in here is L. It is, it's this characteristic length. So we're interested in the change in pressure over this, change, the, the, this characteristic length. And so then if we solve that equation, if we solve that equation uh, for tau, we should get something like tau is equal to 1 over delta P, uh, eta over K L squared. Now, let's, we'll come back to this and take a little aside. So in one dimension, if I have a little piece of material, and it might be, it might be easy to think of this material as a solid, but it works for your fluid, too. And I apply a stress to that material, a force, a pressure, right? call it sigma. And I deform that material. So this material has some original length L and some deformed length. Well, let's say original length LO, some deformed length L. And what's, what's strain? Like, what's our definition of strain in one dimension? You know, change in length, change in length over original length, right? And just depending on what your sign convention want, if you want positive strain to be compression or tension, then your change in length is defined as um, L minus L0 or L0 minus L, right? So in this case, we'll, we'll consider compression. Uh, I want this to be positive compression, yeah. So we'll consider it like this, right? And so then if I plot the stress versus strain, if it's an elastic material, I get a curve like that, and the slope of this is 
Mm. Young Smoggers. We've talked about that before. But I just want to remind you of that so that now I'm going to generalize this idea to three dimensions. So now I have, instead of just a one-dimensional deformation, assume I have a cube here. And I'm going to apply stress to all sides of the cube equally. We'll call it sigma. So this is the same stress on all sides. And that's going to cause my cube to deform into a smaller cube. Right. And so now we know we know str we know stress is a tensor, right? We've talked about that in the class. But in this case, since since we're applying the same stress normally to all sides, then we'll just say that the stress is tensor looks like this. Okay. And so if I wanted to say what the average stress is on the thing, we'll define the average stress as the stress zero zero is equal to one third the trace, right? So in this case, sigma plus sigma plus sigma. There's three sigmas divided by three. The average stress is just sigma. Right? So this is how, because we have a three-dimensional thing, we have to, to be mathematically correct. We have to say that stress is a tensor. But then we're going to define we're going to define this average stress, this average hydrostatic stress, according to that equation. And likewise, for the strain, strain is also a tensor. In this case, you'd have some sigma xx. Right. Now, if I, have a, if I have a cube and I apply the same stress to each side, and the way to do this is to put it in like a fluid bath. Right? If, I, if I have a cube of material and I put it in a bath of fluid, and then I increase the pressure of that fluid, I'm going to apply the same stress to all sides of that material. And it's going to deform the material, but will the strains all be equal? If I apply a constant stress, will all the strains be equal? Uh, it does depend on the material. The, the inequality could be uh, more significant in, other, in materials that are anisotropic than they would be in isotropic materials. Uh, but even in isotropic materials, there'd be a difference due to something called a Poisson effect, potentially, right? And so, so, I, in, so for, in terms of like an average strain, I'm not going to try to define an average strain. I'm just going to say that, that sigma zero, zero, I mean, sorry, epsilon zero, zero is just the trace, right? So it's just the sum of those things. And then if I were to plot, and the, the reason what I'm trying to do here is I have tensors, right? These are tensors, and I don't really know how to plot a tensor versus a tensor, right? So what I'm trying to do is plot, uh, you know, come up with a scalar value that's representative of the deformation from the tensor, come up with a scalar, because I can plot a scalar versus a scalar easier. Right? So I've just taken those tensors and I've defined scalar quantities the average deformation and, and, the, and the, the volumetric strain, that's what this is called, the volumetric strain. This is called the hydrostatic stress. This is called the volumetric strain. And if I plot those against each other, if it's an elastic material, I would also get a straight line. And the slope of that line has a name. We usually use the symbol K. Does anybody know what it's called? It's called the bulk nodules. It's called the bulk nodules. 
Okay. So let's look at a volumetric strain that's equal to 1. And over here, we're going to just label this. We're going to assume that if the volumetric strain is equal to 1, then we're going to call this stress delta P. So the, the hydrostatic stress associated with the volumetric strain of 1 is delta P. So then if I were to write, you know, the slope, right, is K. The slope is K. Then an equation for that slope, according to those two definitions, right, the rise over the run, delta P over 1. Okay. So then I could invert that equation, and I could just say uh, delta P is equal to 1 over K, 1 over the bulk modulus. And 1 over the bulk modulus has a name, we'll call that beta. And that has a name that you guys are probably more familiar with. The compressibility. Right. So all of this was just to give you some pictorial sort of thought experiments to associate with our now grown up definitions of stress and strain and some things we could plot on a 2D axis, material properties we can measure back to things you're familiar with. And so now we have a relationship between delta P and the compressibility um, that we can then go back, plug into our set of equations here. And so now we have beta is equal to eta over K L squared. Now our beta, our beta was the total compressibility of the fluid and the solid. So we can then split that up to say that we have the porosity times the compressibility of the fluid plus the compressibility of the rock. And whenever we write it like this, it's, it, it's important to understand that. So we have the porosity times the compressibility of the fluid. That's sort of easy to understand, right? There's only fluid in the pores. So we only want to include, yeah? Uh, I got lost in the back of the slide of talking about the different kinds of stress. Yeah. Is it A equals delta P over 1? And then you said delta P equals 1 over K. Uh, probably, I, I must uh, I, I told you I'm working without notes, and I, I, I made a mistake, I guess. Um, yeah, let's go back. Let's see. Yeah, it should be the opposite, right? So, yeah, thank you. No. Let's see. This is right, right? To the right. That's right. Um, I will know what's wrong. Confuse myself. This is okay. This relationship is true. Let's see, uh, 
I'm not seeing what a mistake is, right? But our, uh, k is definitely 1 over beta, right? So if I invert those equations, that implies 1 over beta. I'm sorry, that implies beta is 1 over delta p. Let's see. I don't think there's a mistake now. Uh, oh no. No. Here, let's let's just erase all this and see what's going. Somehow in all this clicking back and forth, I seem to have lost the use of my pen over here. Um, so rise over run, delta p over 1 is equal to k. And k is equal to 1 over the, bolt mo uh, one over the compressibility. So if I, if I invert those equations, I have 1 over delta p equal to 1 over k equal to beta. So I'm not sure where I made a mistake before, but this is the relationship I care about. This, this comes from that, right? This comes from that plot. This is a definition the name we associate, right? One over the, one over the, the uh, bulk modulus is the compressibility or vice versa. So I'm not sure what I wrote down before and how I got confused, but this is, this is okay. <coughs> oh, is that what I had? Okay. Yeah. So there, I just, I got confused in my line of thought, but where I was going was, was okay, right? So this comes from that plot this is a definition, invert those equations, and you get this. And then uh, back here, then uh, that gives us just replacing 1 over delta p with beta, and then splitting beta. This is the total compressibility of the rock and the fluid. And so just then to, to make the point I was starting to make there, um, a rock has hole, holes in it that are filled with fluid. The volume of these holes, the volume of the holes divided by the total volume is what we call the porosity. So therefore, to get the total compressibility, we want the compressibility of the fluid times the porosity. Right? And then, you know, add that, add to that the compressibility of the rock. But when I say the compressibility of the rock, just to, and that's why I needed the picture here. You, you might think, well, you're talking about this compressibility, right? It's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the compressibility of the rock matrix, right, which includes the, the holes, right, includes the, the porosity. So another word, another word we use for that is the skeleton. Right? And so we're talking about the compressibility of the skeleton, which is going to be different than the compressibility of the rock, right? And I think this is, should be kind of just obvious, right? If I... How many, know, how many know what steel wool is? Right? Steel wool? 
Use it to clean things, right? Yeah, it's kind of a spongy steel, right? If I imagine that you have a piece of steel wool, like anybody can grab that steel wool and just squeeze it with their hands, right? So the compressibility of steel wool is much less than if that same size specimen was solid steel. Right? If it's solid steel, none of us could squeeze it out, right? So what we're what we're talking about here with the compressibility of the rock is the compressibility of the rock matrix, this thing, or think of the steel wool. <laughs> so if you plug some real numbers in, so that all that was just to explain where this equation come from. If you plug some real numbers in, um, tau is on the order, and, and all we have to do is work with orders of magnitudes here to, to understand this. For a low, for something very low permeability like a sand, that's a, sand is a high permeability, but this is a even a low permeability sand would have something on the order of one millibars of permeability. Then tau is going to be on the order of years for a tenth of a kilometer reservoir, right? So that's a realistic size for a reservoir, for the thickness of a reservoir, or, or a thickness of a uh, encapsulating layer on top of a reservoir. So tau is on the order of years. Well, if we're thinking about sedimentation processes, uh, you know, that would, barring some like landslide or some massive uh, instantaneous event, you know, sedimentation typically also occurs in the order of years. So in this scenario, you wouldn't expect a lot of uh, disequilibrium compaction. Yeah? Um, what do you think of uh, Yeah, it's a measure. You know, you know what steel wool is, right? It's a, it's a measure of, the, of how easy it is to squeeze that steel wool. Now, F is the fluid only, right? So you can think of like if you if you had some water in a in a balloon, where you know the membrane itself is not that strong. But so think about trying to squeeze a you know water. Right? Yeah. So then, uh, however, a low permeability shale has you know on the order of nanodarcy permeability. Then now tau is on the order of uh, 100,000 years, right? So now we're approaching something where you know you can have significant sedimentation in the Mississippi River, for example, of over 100,000 years. So any fluid that's trapped below, any fluid that's trapped below a low permeability shale in the Gulf of Mexico, where you have Mississippi River constantly producing sediment, then and, and you have these time constants on the order of 100,000 years, then you're going to get overpressure scenarios. Right? So. Um, I hate not being able to use my pen. Let me just take a second to see if I can get this to work again. I don't know what happened there. Maybe, maybe I got it back. All right. Um, so then uh, if we look at this is some real data from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, and, and these are you know gamma ray resistivity logs, uh, sand percentage, shell porosity, and other things. But the thing to look at here is the pressure. Uh, as you go down, then you see a significant change from an initial hydrostatic. So this line is hydrostatic there uh, with depth, and then. see sort of a significant change at some point in the pressure um, approaching lithostatic. This is due to overpressurization. And, and this is in the Gulf of Mexico, so the mechanism is disequilibrium compaction. 
Yeah, so there's, there would be some. Yeah, I mean, if, if from the reservoir all the way to the surface were hot, was sand, then it would constantly diffuse, right? So there has to be some seal, right? So there, that's where that number came from. Uh, go back a slide. This number here, where this characteristic length is on the order of like a tenth of a kilometer, you know, this would be, and again, we, all you have to do is work with orders of magnitude to sort of understand. Um, a tenth of a kilometer would be representative thickness of a shale seal, possibly. Right? And, then, and then you plug in real numbers for compressibility, permeability, fluid viscosity, and other things, and then you get this, these giant numbers. Right? So it just, conceptually, I mean, th this just adds some physical intuition to this concept of disequilibrium compaction. You can put some real numbers in there and understand why this occurs. 